السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today, unfortunately, is the last class for the series about the prophets, and then inshallah we'll have a break until uh, until about mid January. We'll recommence inshallah mid January. And I'll put on my Facebook page, inshallah. We'll put on the uh, Preston Mosque Facebook page. And we'll start a new series, inshallah, called the Khulafa al Rashidun. The uh, rightly guided caliphs, the four caliphs after Muhammad. Today, inshallah, we'll talk about part three of the life of Prophet Jesus Christ, Isa al Masih, alayhi salam. So you need to review the last two lectures to catch up to what we're up to now. So I'm going to continue from where I left off, inshallah. So Isa, Jesus, alayhi salam, started to sense, he started to sense that there were members from the children of Israel who were conspiring against him. And these members, they were among the elites of the land in Jerusalem and Palestine, those areas. And they didn't like to follow the teachings of the Torah, the words sent to Moses. And they didn't like that Jesus Christ came with a new book the Injil, the Bible, to reconfirm what was lost of the Torah after they were following a new tradition. These specific people did not like to follow the exact laws of the Bible sent to Moses and it was changed. And they got used to it. They established their kingdoms and their authority and their reputation and their wealth on the new laws which they twisted and invented. They still believed in one God. They still believed in Moses and all the prophets before him. But they twisted the words of the Torah. Allah testifies to this in the Quran. He says, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ they changed the meanings of the words of the Torah from what they actually mean. You get a word and you know that it might have five different meanings and you ignore the context and give it a different meaning. So they did that with the Torah. Gave it different meanings to what it's meant to be. Taking it out of context and as time went on, the words were even changed. Then came the Injil. The Bible, the holy book, sent to Jesus Christ. It returned back the old traditions. And now their kingdoms and their authority is at risk. They're losing followers. So Isa alayhi salam begins a campaign against them. And he gets some supporters. But... They wouldn't stop. They started more of a campaign against him, a character assassination they called it. They called him an imposter. They started talking about his mother Maryam, saying that Mary committed adultery or fornication. She slept with some guy. They gave him different names. And that Jesus Christ is an illegitimate child. He is not the true Messiah sent by God. He's a criminal, therefore a fraud. And Allah testifies in the Quran, He says, also what they said about Mary, mother of Jesus, and what they said about Jesus Himself, they made up lies and accused them of heinous crimes which they didn't do. So Allah says in the Quran, 
فلما أحس عيسى بكفرهم when Isa alayhi salam started to sense the disbelief of a large number of the children of Israel and here kufr means to distort the truth and hide it or change it that's kufr but what they were changing was the truth from Allah that's a high level, high order of kufr a husband and wife may make kufr on each other for example the husband may say after seeing all good from his wife he points to the bad that she's ever done and says you haven't done any good all i've seen from you is bad or the wife turns around and says to her husband i've never seen any good from you this is called kufr al -ashi, to do kufr on your spouse meaning to deny the good that they have and here this is kufr against allah and his messenger to deny the truth and to hide it. And that's the higher order of kufr. Allah says, When Isa perceived their leaning towards unbelief, he asked, Qala man ansari ila Allah. He said, Who are my victors to Allah? Who will support me? I need supporters. And a group of men stood up and they said, We will support you, O Messenger of God. We have believed in Allah and be our witness that we have submitted ourselves exclusively to Allah. Different to what the Christians talk about the disciples. If you've ever seen the picture of the Leonardo... Uh, yes, Da Vinci, I think. The, uh, the portrait of the Last Supper and they've got 12 apostles. I and mean, even here in Australia we have the Great Ocean Road, the 12 apostles. Big stones, they call them 12 apostles. So we share some belief about that, except that these the nature of these 12 apostles is that they were helpers of Jesus Christ and they did not believe he was the God or a son of God. In the Quran, Allah tells us that they were his helpers and victors. And they believed in Allah, not in Jesus, in the Lord of Jesus. Which makes more sense, of course. As Jesus himself prayed to God and taught the people to pray. And it would be absurd to say that Jesus Christ was just teaching them how to pray by directing his prayer to God, to the Father, to tell them this is how you pray. It's a mix-up. Jesus Christ never said so. Anyway, brothers and sisters, these helpers, they stood up and they tried to defend Isa salam in everything. Their wealth and property. They sacrificed their lives. They put their lives on the line. They were ready to die in the cause of their Prophet Isa and his protection. Exactly like the companions of the Prophet Muhammad like the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the migrants and the Ansar. And these Ansar of Isa and they were called Hawariyun. Hawariyun means special Ansar, special victims and helpers. And they are like the people of Medina, the Ansar of Medina, who also welcomed Muhammad Sallallahu to their homes and said we pledge our lives, our wealth and our family in your protection and messenger of God. And these are exactly the Hawariyun. And even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim alike, he used to say to his companions, every Prophet had Hawariyun. Every Prophet had helpers and victors. And Isa Alayhi Salam had Ansar. Right? And he said, you are my Ansar, you are my victors. So, brothers and sisters, this is the nature of these Ansar. They were highly noble, righteous people who pledged their lives to save Isa alayhi salam. They hid him when they found that these people started to conspire to kill Isa alayhi salam. At this point, we don't know who they are. All we know is they are a large elite group who have gotten these positions and influenced the people to follow them in false from among the children of Israel. Children of Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And recall when I restrained the Israelites from you. So again, Allah does not call them a specific religion or name. He calls them the Israelites, meaning those who were born from the ancestor Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salam, the prophet, the father of Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salam, he was also named Israel. And all his progeny that were born from him, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they branched off to become the children of Israel. 
And recall when I restrained the Israelites from you, when you came to them with clear proofs, whereupon those of them who disbelieved said, this is nothing but clear magic. This is what the group that was against Isa were forging about. And my brothers and sisters, this particular group, I will not hide it from you, of course, I think you've already worked it out. This was the particular group that later on in history took on the name Yahud, which means the Jews. They came out from among the children of Israel. You should not call the Israelites Jews. And in fact, the Jews, Zionists who are illegally occupying Palestine today, they have, uh, what, what's the word for it? They, they hijacked the name Israel. This does not belong to them. The Israelites are all the people who belonged in the time of Moses and Jesus, including people who branched off into Islam and into what they call today Christianity and its denominations. Among them are children of Israel. So the Israelites are not just the Israelis in, as they call themselves, in this is a forgery of the name, and it's a hijacking of the name. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah says about these Jews in the Quran, he tells the story of Isa salam here, he says that they boasted and lied about the killing of Jesus. It was then, the ancestors of the Jews today, according to the Qur'an, who forged the, the, the conspiracy, they forged the accusation, they forged the idea that they had killed Jesus Christ. Because it was them who wanted to kill Him, no one else. And so they boasted after someone was crucified on the cross, and they said, well that was the guy who calls himself the Messiah, son of Mary. We killed him. We are the heroes who got rid of the fraud. That's what they say. Allah says in the Quran, and they're saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Allah calls him the messenger of Allah. Whereas, in fact, they had neither slain him, they didn't kill him, nor crucified him, they did not put him on the cross and kill him either. But the matter was made dubious to them. It was made as if so. And the word dubious means that they split. None of them were sure or had enough evidence till today that they actually killed Jesus Christ or crucified him. I challenge any knowledgeable Christian who has reached a state of, pro, of uh, postgraduate degrees, who study the scripture carefully, text of tradition, to tell me that it is proven. The normal Christian believes that. The normal church teaches the people that in their own way. But the knowledgeable Christians the priests and above, people, the professors, the scholars of Christianity, and I have met many of them and spoken about this myself. They cannot prove it for sure. But they say, well, it's symbolic. It's something to hold on to, to guide us. We focus on the morals, which are some of them are good, values are good. Something to hold on to, keep us going. But is it the truth? No. Would you rather have correct morals and values with the truth or correct morals and values but you're following false you'll be good in this life but in the hereafter Jesus Christ will say I'm innocent my brothers and sisters in Islam there was someone who said to me well if someone's good doesn't don't they go to paradise I said well what's the meaning of good like if I work for Ford the company for it. How can I expect Holden to pay me? Right? 
if you did good for Jesus Christ, then Allah said, well, Jesus Christ will be called to pay you, but he'll say I'm innocent. You worship God, Allah. Otherwise, you make up your own beliefs, your own laws, and you can play around with them, as the church has played around with it today. Alcohol was forbidden upon them, they made it allowed. Pork was forbidden upon them, they made it allowed. Covering of the, the woman's covering her hair and wearing modest clothing in such a way that we see the Muslims today, well, the practicing Muslims, they changed it, the church changed it. They changed many things, actually. So my brothers and sisters, Allah does not accept that. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whereas in fact they had neither slain him nor crucified him, but it was made to appear to them that way dubiously, and those who differed about it too were in a state of doubt. Allah states in the Quran something, see the Quran is not outdated. The Quran is ahead of its time. Wallahi, it is ahead of its time. It's ahead of today's time. It makes a statement, and those who differed about it too were in a state of doubt. We still recite these verses till today, and we still affirm that till today, knowledgeable Christians know that they are still in doubt. It's just interpretation and assumption. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا They did not kill him out of certainty. إِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا الظَّنِ Allah says in the Quran, they are merely following their assumptions, their own conclusions, not facts. وَمَا تَهْوَ الْأَنفُسِ And some of them, what their desires desire. My brothers and sisters, Allah says then, they have no definite knowledge of it. They don't have definite knowledge of it. But merely follow conjecture, and they surely slew him not. So who are the ones who differed? They are the Christians in this Quran. In this verse, Allah is saying the Christians differed. The Christians themselves don't know if they killed him or not, if he was killed or not, or if he was crucified or not. So what did happen? Let us now look at the Quranic version. We are the only religion in the world that clears this up. And says this statement, no other religion does. The Jews don't say it, and the Christians don't say it. Allah tells us in the Quran, but Allah raised him to himself. Allah is almighty, all wise. But Instead, Allah raised Jesus Christ to him, to the heavens. That's all we know. What does raised him to the heavens mean? Well, let's just see the verses. Allah said in Surah Al-Ma'idah and it was part of his scheme meaning part of God's plan when Allah said O oh Jesus I will recall you I will call you again you will come back and raise you up to me and will purify you of the company of those who disbelieve and will set your followers above the unbelievers till the day of resurrection then to me you shall return, and I will judge between you regarding what you differed. I will recall you, meaning I will save you. I will bring you and save you from the people, and then I'm going to raise you up to me. And will purify you of the company of those who disbelieve, those who want to kill you. And your followers will be triumphant. They will believe in the true one, I'll give them victory over them. My brothers and sisters in Islam, you put all the verses of the Qur'an and you understand that they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, and that Allah saved him from their hands. He would not anyone touch his prophet, his messenger of Jesus Christ, and Allah took him and raised him. Now we have different interpretations about the details of what actually happened. We find in Al-Bidaw and Nihaya, for example, by Ibn Kathir, we have Al-Tabari, for example, Tariq Al-Tabari, the historian. We have uh, um, also... Uh, uh, several Islamic history books they tell us and in Tafsir ibn Kathir it talks about uh, maybe that when they came to kill Jesus Christ السلام, they entered they tried to enter the home where they thought he was and Jesus Christ was lifted by God in flesh and soul and I'll explain how I understood that and they captured another man who appeared like he was Jesus Christ and this is 
the more accurate translation we have, that they captured a guy who looked like Jesus Christ. And this would support the words of the later Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John that came out after, after Jesus, the Bible that was sent to Jesus Christ, 300 years later actually. I'll talk about that in a minute. What it supports it is that they did crucify someone. They did drag someone. They did torture someone. And it's possible they did put those chains, that, that, that helmet chain around uh, his head. And it's possible, yes, they did, uh, they did put him onto the cross and bang him with nails. That was the custom and the way that they tortured criminals in those days, is to crucify criminals. And they crucified this guy next to other criminals that were beside him. And now, when we look at this, we find that it makes much more sense, even according to the current Bible that people read. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually lifted Jesus Christ and he was not found anymore. His body could not be found. Why in flesh and blood? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but Allah lifted him to him. In flesh and soul, or just in soul? It will not make sense to say that God just lifted him in his soul. Why? Because it will contradict the, the, the words before it. Allah said they did not kill him or crucify him. If it's just the soul, then it's possible that they crucified and killed his body and everyone's soul goes up. But Allah said, no, they did not crucify him or kill him, meaning his body. But Allah lifted him, meaning he lifted him, his body and his soul together. They couldn't reach him. Now there's a controversy. Was he dead? And then God lifted him. Did God cause him to die and then lift him? Or did God cause him to go unconscious and lift him? One of the two. We're not sure. But the correct opinion that most scholars rest on is that he was alive and Allah lifted him. But even if, let's say, perhaps the evidence shows that he died and then God lifted him, it does not contradict our belief that they didn't crucify him. The Qur'an says, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him, but it was made to appear to them that way dubiously and they are still in doubt till today. But did God cause him death and lift him or did he lift him, lift him alive? That's only known to Allah, but the point is they didn't get to him. Now we look uh, in uh, the current Bible, the current Bible which the Christians follow, the Catholics follow, in a chapter called Matthew, chapter 27, verse 46. Just an example of many examples. When we look at the verses in the Qur'an and compare it to this chapter in the Bible, their Bible, the current false Bible we say, Allah says, God says in the Qur'an, it appeared to them as if so. Now let's look at the chapter 27, Matthew, verse 46. It says, they claim that the guy who was on the cross, they claim was Jesus, he says in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, close to Arabic, ilahi, ilahi, lima sabaytani, or lima taraktani. What's sabaytani? It means, O oh God, O oh God, why have you forsaken me? O oh God, O oh God, and the Hebrew word Eli Eli is not really just God, God. Eli Eli means Ilahi Ilahi in Hebrew. In Arabic, Ilahi Ilahi means O oh, the God who I worship. Ilah literally means the God whom I worship. If it was Jesus Christ that was on the cross, that means he worshipped God. And that contradicts the statement that he is God or the Son of God. If he was an, a different guy, it also makes sense that he is calling upon his God whom he worships. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, O my Lord whom I worship, my God who I worship, why have you forsaken me? Now, why would Jesus Christ say, O my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would he even call upon him as God? And why would he say forsaken me if Jesus Christ, according to the claim of the Christians, that he was sent as the only begotten Son of God to die for our sins. I'm just, you know, summarizing the words in common terms. If he knows he has gone out to that mission, 
Why would he then give up and say, Oh God, oh God. Now they say, Oh, because he was in the human flesh and he was suffering and to show us his suffering. Still doesn't make sense. So was he a human temporarily? Was he suffering, therefore he's not a God? Or is he temporary human? Or was he for a little while forgot that he was God? What, what was it? Again, they will go around and around and around and around and they will never come to something that makes sense. Except two things. They'll say it is a mystery. It will stay a mystery. And like every other religion will call their gods a mystery. You can just call anything a mystery and get away with it. Or you can say the Holy Spirit is not in you. Like something has to come in you to magically make you believe without your control. And that contradicts even the Quran. Allah says, we do not force anyone to convert. We have shown them the guidance. Either you accept or you reject. And each has its consequence. And that's the Quranic version and the Islam, which all the prophets taught till today. And that makes absolute sense in every sense of the word. My dear brothers and sisters, this guy whom they killed was most likely another person whom they assumed it was Jesus. Now remember, those people who wanted to kill him, who became the Jews later on, not all of them saw Jesus Christ. It was a large land. And Jesus Christ had only was a prophet for three years. So not everybody had seen him. They heard about him and they went looking for him, the soldiers. And when they found him, they took someone hastily, without thinking, hastily. You can imagine now people coming in and there's people trying to defend and there's the disciples of Jesus Christ trying to stand at the door and not let them come in. They're fighting through and then they see a guy, perhaps they were protecting a guy or perhaps that guy was standing aside or perhaps he appeared. He looked like Jesus Christ as though he was described and grabbed him, dragged him and he's saying, leave me, leave me or trying to cry to them. They put him onto the cross and he said, oh my Lord, do I worship God? God, why have you forsaken him? And he's suffering like a human being. That makes more sense, as Allah said. Now, brothers and sisters, after the crucifixion happened, Allah tells us in the Quran, From among them, those who were witnessing, and their, whoever was with them at the time of the crucifixion, they divided into different groups. Ahzab, different groups, denominations. And they all differed about the nature of Jesus Christ. Allah says, Woe to those who disbelieve and hide the truth. From the sight of an enormous great day, meaning the day of judgment. You are going to be brought for those who forged this disbelief. And you will have to face the consequence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, or actually in the hadith of Prophet and in the tafsir, Muslims know that groups divided. Among the main groups were the following. Number one, those who did not believe he was Jesus Christ at all and that Jesus Christ never was sent. The Messiah was never sent. And he is still yet to come in the future. They are the Jews. They are the Jews. Then there was another group. They said, no, he was truly Jesus Christ, but God lifted him. And they are the Muslims on the truth. Muslim, in that, Muslim doesn't mean us like any given time, the word Muslim is a, is a verb and a noun. It means someone who submits to the truth. That's all. So they were Muslim. And then there was a third group. They said, no, Jesus Christ was God himself. He was God. And then a fourth group said, no, Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And then they added, as the, after 300 years, begotten. And begotten, if you look it up in the dictionary, any dictionary, you will find that the word begotten means when a man has intercourse with a woman and she is impregnated. 
That's the word we got. Now they'll give you different translations and interpretations, but there's no truth to it. It's just twisting. And so they said, he's the Son of God. So we have Christians who are called, used to be called Unitarians, or uh, they're also called non-Trinitarians. Today we still have them. They're a very small minority, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. The non-Trinitarians. And there are so many other groups today they believe in these different things. God, Son of God. Some of them say Mary, Mother of God. Mary, the Mother of Jesus, Mother of God, they say, which means Jesus God, who is the Father, therefore, who is the Holy Spirit, and so on. It's mumble jumbled. It's not correct. And I don't mean to belittle or disrespect the Christians. However, we are talking knowledge here and facts and reality. That this does not come from the true Bible. And I'm going to tell you something, all of you to understand this, brothers and sisters. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, But different parties began to dispute with one another. A dreadful woe awaits on that great day for those who, that reject the truth. Jesus, they said he was an imposter. Others, they said son of God. Others, they said he was God incarnate. Some said Jesus saved God. Another man was mistaken. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you that the actual Bible that Jesus Christ spoke and revealed is lost. They do not have it anywhere in the world. No one has it. This is what they call the Bible now. That is not the Bible sent upon Jesus. And just like the Torah of the Jews today, it was lost. There is no original copy. There is no original wordings. And they can't trace it. However, Dozens of what they call Gospels, Gospels, that's what they call it, dozens of Gospels circulated in early Christian community approximately 50 years after Jesus Christ. After Jesus Christ. Gospels, like words. In, in Islam, we don't, these Gospels, they're like, you know what you know it's like for Muslims? It's similar to Hadith. You know Hadith? The Prophet's sayings. But even our hadith are more accurate. Because our hadith can be traced all the way back to the actual man or woman who literally sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ and heard it from him directly or a group. We have it all the way documented one by one with their lives and their character and their ancestors and their bloodline, everything, every single person. Our hadith is even stronger. But what they have is something even secondary to hadith. What they thought Jesus Christ said or taught. So what happened? In about 325 AD or CE after Jesus Christ, for the first time, they got confused. Which gospel should we follow? Where is the Bible? Where is the complete Bible? Each one says something a little bit different to the other. And so there were over a dozen different Gospels. There was one called the, uh, the, the Gospel of Thomas. The other was called the Gospel of Peter. And there was a very strange one was called the Q document. The Q document was the most accurate, almost, but it was lost. <laughs> no one knows where it is and how it came about. It's gone. The Gospel of Thomas was gone. The Gospel of Peter was gone. And they finally agreed on four books. Four Gospels. They called them the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John. They are four books written by four different people. One of them was a Jew and then he converted to Christianity. One of them was a criminal and he had repented and came back. And they existed 300 years after. Um, sorry, 100 to 200 years after Jesus Christ. They never met Jesus Christ. But what they claimed was they were inspired, meaning they felt that these were his teachings. And so they sat on four specific Gospels and they called it the Bible. Actually, no one knows who wrote these Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John did not write them. They just carried them on and compiled them and added to them. But no one actually knows who really wrote these Gospels. No one. Trust me, no one. Academic people know this. Christian theologians and bishops, they met around the 2nd or the 3rd century in France. 
and it has a name. It's a historical name. You can Google it. Easy. Everyone can Google it. It's, it's called the First Council of Nicaea in 325 in France. The First Council of Nicaea. And they decided on the four Gospels. And so they decided what went in and they decided what went out. And they called it the Bible. That's the one of today that they follow. So I say to my Christian friends and to all some Muslims, it was the church who convinced you that this is the Bible from God. But a little Google search, there's the blessing now of the internet, a tiny Google search, the first council of Nicaea in 325, you can even type, how did the Bible come about? How did the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John come together? And you will see that it was decided by a group of men and kings and people of authority in 325 AD or CE. And they were confused, so they come together on these four books. And they put it together just to save their religion. And this is all before Muhammad sallallahu So this is what they call the Bible today. Don't ever call today's Bible in Jeep. The word Bible means holy book. Holy book. The Quran is a holy book. It's also called the Bible. The Injil is called the Bible. The one sent down by Jesus Christ. Even the word Injil means called the holy book. Torah is a holy book. Zabur is called the Bible. They're all Bibles. Holy book. My brothers and sisters in Islam, now what? We've got all these groups till today. You've got all these denominations of Christianity and Judaism. We're not here to talk about them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us to always try to talk to them on common grounds. And we call them the people of the book. So God, Allah in the Quran gave the Christians and Jews after that a respectful name. They are the only religions in the world which we the Muslims in the Quran, according to the Quran, give them a respectable name. They are called people of the book. Ahlul Kitab. And this is Almost like it's a nice thing, but it's also a two-edged sword for them. How? You are the people of the book, but the current book you have has been distorted. So you did not fulfill the trust of being the people of the book. You did not keep it. And those who came later did not question it. And you just went away with it. We will call you the people of the book out of respect. But at the same time, people of the book is a responsibility which they have failed. I'm not talking about the common Christian. I'm talking about the people, the churches, they have failed to uphold it. So you are people of the book who have failed your duty. This is what the Quran is saying. Nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to have some relationship with the people of the book and come to common grounds. We still all say we believe in one God, except the Christians have changed it to a trinity, which is a problem. But at the end of the day, they'll tell you one God. Jews say one God. We say one God. So do the Sikhs, they say one God. But they follow, they don't follow any of our prophets. And uh, we call them people of the book so we can eat from their slaughtered meat. Their food is halal for us. When you put halal, it means, it means halal. The word halal for food means coexist with your Christian and Jewish counterparts. Your, your Christian and Jewish neighbors. That's what it means. It means come together and be a community. That's what the word halal means. They should put halal equals community with different religions. Halal is not just for Muslims. Halal means the food of the Christians and the food of the Jews. We can eat them as well, which means we have a common ground. We come together. We can also, as Muslims, marry from well, the men can. The men Muslims can marry from the Christian or Jewish women. And there's a long story to that. Why only men, not women. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that today. Inshallah, we'll talk about it and talk about the Khulafa later on because it needs a bit of discussion. However, it's all about coming together and coexisting and living in harmony. That's, that's the point. Now, what do we believe about Jesus Christ السلام, after this, all of this hullabaloo, this, this whole confusion that had happened? Well, in Islam, the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us that Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to come back to earth. 
And when he comes back, he will not come back following the Bible sent to him. Because it's gone. He will come back following the final Bible, the final revelation sent by God. The last one, which is the Quran. You know, in law, in, in, in law, government law, if there is a new law, new legislation, the old legislation is obsolete. You replace it with the new. No one can come and say, I'm going to work by the law that was 50 years ago. They take the current law. So Jesus Christ will not come on the old Bible. He will come on the new one, which is the Quran, the final revelation from God. Because he believes that God is the one who sent the revelations, whether it's him or Moses or Muhammad, peace be upon him. All of them were messengers of God. Allah says, We make no distinction between any of them, between Muhammad, Jesus, Jesus, or Musa. We don't make any distinction between them. My brothers and sisters, what do we believe? Rasulullah Muhammad said in this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. He said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَيُوشِكَنَّ أَنْ يَنْزِلَ فِيكُمْ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ حَكَمًا عَدْلًا He said, by the one who possesses my soul in his hands, by God. Very soon now, it's soon, that Isa, the son of, the son of Maryam, is going to descend, is going to come down. And how is he going to come down? As what? حَكَمًا A judge. Adlan and just and fair. He will be absolutely just and fair as a judge among you. Fayaksira Salib. He will break the cross. What does it mean to break the cross? This is a metaphor. Not literally he will go around breaking every cross in the world. No. Can you imagine that's climbing up on top of churches and breaking them? That's not what he's going to be doing. Yaksir Salib is a metaphor. It means he will stop and put an end to the false belief in the cross. He'll break that ideology. And there will be Christians who will follow him in the right way. This is in the Quran actually. Before his actual death. What else did the Prophet say? وَيَقْتُلَ الْخِنْزِيرِ And he will kill the pig. Again, this is a metaphor. It means that he will Return the people back to the original teachings of not eating pork. It's forbidden. And in one narration it says that he will allow the killing of pigs. Allah, God knows best. He will place a special type of tax for people who do not want to enter into Islam and follow him. We have as Muslims Zakat. We pay two and a half percent of our wealth each year for accumulated wealth that we do not need. But we don't pay jizya, a tax. This is what we pay. As for others who live under Islam, who don't want to follow Islam, we cannot force them to pay zakat. But they still have to contribute to the community. And that's called a jizya, which means a tax. And it's a small amount, very small amount, not like the tax today. 30% and 35% of your wealth is a very small amount for those who are able. Similar to zakat, except that it's not by God. And in exchange, we give them protection, security, welfare, peace, and protect them and their allies from any enemy, regardless if they're Muslim or not Muslim. That's what we give in return. Very different to the tax system today. So he will bring that back. وَيَفِيضَ الْمَالُ حَتَّى لَا يَقْبَلَهُ أَحَدٍ Wealth in his time will increase until there will be no one poor enough to be asking for charity. That's the time of Jesus Christ. So it's a beautiful time. Poverty will be gone. He will extinguish poverty. That's what we believe about Jesus Christ. People will return back to love the worship of God as it truly is, to the point where one sajda, one bowing, one prostration to any person becomes more beloved to them than the entire world and whatever is connected. You can see the strong belief in back to Allah. Then Abu Hurairah narrates this hadith, he says, 
If you like, you can recite the verse in the Quran which supports this. Allah says, وَإِن مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَأُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ There will be among the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians towards the end of time, who will believe in Jesus Christ before he actually dies. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا And on the day of judgment, Jesus Christ will bear witness in front of God that these people, O oh God, among the, who used to be Christians and Jews, they followed me correctly and he will ask Allah to save them. Who will bear witness for them. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu said, يَنْزِلُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ عِنْدَ الْمِنَارَةَ الْبَيْضَاءَ شَرْقِي شَرْقِيَ دِمَشْقَ Jesus Christ will actually come down from heaven. Where? In Damascus. You know current day Syria? Damascus? There. It's to be called Dimash. On the east of Damascus, closer to Palestine, close to Jerusalem, on the east of Syria, of Damascus, where, he says, where the white minaret is. The white minaret. Subhanallah. There is a mosque today in Dimash called Masjid al minar al Baydar, the mosque or the masjid, the mosque of the white minaret, still has its name till today, and it still stands, subhanAllah, regardless of the civil war that's happened. Close to Jerusalem, on the east of Damascus, that's where Jesus Christ, see the detail that we have, he will come down there. How will he descend? He said, Laysa bayni wa bayna Isa nabiyun. There is no prophet between me and Jesus Christ. So after Jesus Christ, no prophet came until Muhammad How long is that? About 600 or 700 years. And then he said, وَإِنَّهُ نَازِلٌ فَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَعْرِفُوهُ رَجُلٌ مَرْبُوعٌ عَلَى الْحُمْرَةِ وَالْبَيَاضِ يَنْزِلُ يَنْزِلُ بَيْنَ مِنْ صَرَتَيْنِ كَأَنَّ رَأْسَهُ يَقْطُرُ وَإِنْ لَمْ يُسِبْهُ بَلَلٍ this hadith is in Muslim, Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet ﷺ said, There is no prophet between me and Jesus Christ. I am the last. And he will come down, and when you see him, you will know him by the following features. He is a man who is marbu'ah. Marbu'ah means he's neither too tall nor too short. عَلَى الْحُمْرَةِ وَالْبَيَاضِ يَنْزِلُ بَيْنَ مِنْ صَلَتَيْنِ مِنْ صَلَتَيْنِ means he will have two pieces of cloths. He's wearing two pieces of garments. Two pieces of garments. One top layer and one bottom. And their color will be bayad humra. The color of the clothes he's wearing. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. The color of his face, of his skin. Now in Arabic it says white reddish. Whitish reddish. And I'll come to that for a, in a second. His hair will look beautiful as if it is dripping with water even though it's not wet. In other words, his hair is beautiful. It is healthy, looking clean and sparkly as if water is in it. And it comes down all the way to his shoulders. It's neither too wavy nor too straight. Now what does it mean that he is whitish reddish? Well, at the time of the Prophet وسلم, it was known among the Arabs. When you call someone white, it doesn't mean the white that we know today. Not the European British white, American, Aussie, Australian white, French white. We don't love that type of white. In those days when the Arabs said white, it meant an Arab tan, but not too dark. So dark, but not too dark. Because you used to have the Arabs, the Bedouins were very, very dark, were African looking. But when you say white, it means they are dark, but not too dark. Compared to the common Arab of those times, the desert Arab. Humra has got some reddish complexion on his cheeks. So he's got really nice, vibrant skin that shines, that you can see redness, a shimmer on his skin. And really, dark people have a shimmer on their skin. Isn't that right, brother? Now we're all jealous, we all want to be dark. We all want to look like Africans, don't we? So my brothers and sisters, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes him as a beautiful, handsome man. 
And you can see subhanAllah Islam is anti-racist. We describe any color as beautiful. Isa alayhi salam is actually in another hadith Prophet says that when he went in Isra al Maraj, he went around the Kaaba and he was praying. He goes, I looked and I saw a man who was about my height. He had beautiful hair that came down to his shoulders and he was leaning on two people's shoulders. They were angels. And I said to Jibreel, Gabriel, who is this man? He was so handsome and he said, Kana Adamiyan. Adamiyan means he was dark. He was tan in color. Because Prophet Adam was tan in color. He was dark in color. And he said, Jibreel said, that is Isa, the son of Maryam. The Prophet said, he will stay among you on earth for 40 years. And then Allah will bring him to die, truly die. And the Muslims will pray janaza on him. Now before Isa dies, in Sahih Muslim as well, and slightly in Bukhari in similar meanings, you can read it under the heading Al-Fitan wal Malahim, which means trials and tribulations towards the end of time, the signs of the last hour. Jesus Christ will have another important mission, an enormous mission. And his ultimate mission will be that God, Allah has saved him, only him, among all the prophets and messengers, to return him back to actually kill the false Messiah. Isa is called the Messiah, but he's called the truthful Messiah. And Messiah was Sadiq. Prophet called him the Messiah, the truthful Messiah. And there's another man, he's called Al Messiah Dajjal, the false Messiah, the lying Messiah, the Antichrist. Why has God saved Isa himself, Jesus Christ, to come and kill him? Why not any other prophet? Because the nature of this Dajjal, this Antichrist guy, who will come towards the end of time, the first thing he will do is that he will claim, he will forge, that he is Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. But it's not. That's what he will say. In fact, the Sahih, in Sahih Muslim, Prophet ﷺ, in his Isra and Maraj, when he was going around the Kaaba as well, he saw another man who looked stocky, coarse hair, dark features, his right eye looked like the pupil was floating, like a sultana. And he described him like some man he knew from Quraysh, not from Quraysh, from the Arabs, the Bedouins. And he asked Jibreel, and he was also reclining on one man on his shoulder. And Jibreel said, said to him, That is Al Masih al Dajjal. That's the false Messiah. When Dajjal comes out, there's a big story about a Dajjal. You can, the best thing I can tell you is you can go on YouTube. I've got a series called The End Series. You can watch that, The End Series. Or there's also a, a website called a YouTube uh, domain. Is it called? The name is called Merciful Servant. The good brothers of ours from the UK, and uh, we gave them permission to edit my talks and put them up there. So it's called a Dajjal from Merciful Servant or the End Series. If you want to learn it in detail, and there are other speakers as well. Sometimes they put other speakers to come in to support my work. So brothers and sisters, this Dajjal will come out. It will be the greatest fitna, the greatest trial to everybody. No other trial like his has ever come before. And he will rule. Basically, the world and the Muslims will be in havoc and turmoil. And there will be oppression until Isa salam comes. And the first thing Jesus Christ will do after breaking the ideology of worshipping the cross and eating the pork, he will go to Jerusalem. Isa salam will enter the mosque in, in, Damas in, in Palestine. sorry, And he will find Al-Mahdi. Al-Mahdi means... Uh, the uh, Al Mahdi, the appointed one, uh, who who will be Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, and he will lead the Muslims and he will fill the Arab world, the Arab world, the Middle East, with justice, just as it was filled with oppression. The hadiths literally say the Arab world. And this man, Al Mahdi, he will try to fight off the Dajjal, but he can't beat him. He can't. The Dajjal is too strong. And he will be in Palestine. The Dajjal will be coming to Palestine to fight the army of the Muslims who are behind this man, Al-Mahdi. 
when Isa, Jesus Christ السلام, would have arrived with a bunch of followers and he will enter Palestine and Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque is not the one with the golden dome. That's where the Prophet ascended. The Aqsa Mosque is in front. And he will enter and find that Al-Mahdi is leading Iman. He's praying Iman with a bunch of Muslims, long, many, many Allah of tens of thousands of soldiers. And when they see Jesus Christ, they will know him. And Ibn Mahdi will try to move back to let Jesus Christ pray Imam <coughs> out of respect. But Jesus Christ says to him, Isa Islam says, No. Every nation has its own Imam. And you are the Imam of this nation. So Isa Islam prays behind Imam al Mahdi. SubhanAllah. Then when they finish from that salat, they go and they find that the Jam and his army had arrived at the gates of Jerusalem. As they're about to charge, Isa السلام, grabs a sword and he comes out. As soon as the Dajjal sees Jesus Christ, he runs away. He runs away and he begins to melt. He begins to melt. Because he has supernatural abilities. But Isa runs after him before the Jal completely melts. And he strikes him with his sword and kills him. And the Jal bleeds. So then Isa turns to the people around him and he says, Look at my sword, look. Because I forgot to say, the Jal, after saying that he is Jesus Christ, he tells the people that he is God. He tells them, I am God. There's a long story told. And you'll find that people from among the Jews will follow him from Israel, what they call Israel today. Falsely, Israel. And from the Christians, there were people who would be following him. Why will they follow him? Because the Christians already believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or God himself. So if the Jew tells them, I'm God, it's not hard for them to believe it. Because they already believe it now. So they'll follow the false Messiah. The Jews? Well, the Jews didn't believe, didn't believe that Jesus Christ came. They thought he was an imposter. And they thought they killed him. And then when Muhammad said they thought he's not a prophet. So they're still waiting for the Messiah. So when this Messiah comes, they'll follow him. And they'll believe whatever he says. <laughs> but the Muslims don't fall for it. And when Jesus Christ kills him, he says to everyone, Look! If he was a God, I would not be able to kill him and look at the blood as evidence, for God does not bleed. Now, we don't know what happens to those people. Do they repent? Are they accepted? Are they not? Only Allah knows, but Allah is just. And so after that, Isa lives lives for 40 years with the Muslims of the world and will be filled with beauty and serenity and as we said, prosperity and peace, as we described before. And he outlives al Mahdi until he dies. We pray Janazah on him and we bury him. Till the day of judgment, Isa alayhi salam will stand and the people will go around saying to all the prophets, help us, help us, but no prophet will be able to help until we reach Jesus Christ. And he will say to him, you know, Isa, you are... You were born from a mother without a father, and Allah Subhanahu wa chose you. Help us. And He will say, Go away from me, go away from me. I have to answer to something in the court of God. People have taken me as a God or a son of God, and God will question me. I am not in a position to intercede for you. And so we go to Muhammad وسلم, and He says, I am the one, I am the one. As for Isa, السلام, He has to answer. Allah will say in front of all the Christians and Jews and everyone will say, O oh, Jesus, son of Mary, are you the one who told the people to take me and my mother two gods instead of me? And Allah will say, and Allah will say to him, and Isa Islam will say to him, No, you know this, and I am innocent of this. My brothers and sisters, that concludes the Prophet's series. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and have uh, accepted from all of us
I ask Allah that whatever I said wrong is from myself to forgive me and whatever I said correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Thank you for coming and inshallah I'll see you back halfway through January. Stay tuned. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa 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 alayhi wa sallam w